Ray Dalio is amongst the most talked about hedge fund managers in the world. When he speaks, people listen, and when he takes action, others do too. His methods have sometimes been criticized, but more often they have been imitated and spurred on new approaches to investing and business. The way he runs his company has influenced how other companies are run too, even outside the financial services industry. Bridgewater Associates, his company, has consistently been one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Over the decades Dalio has been in business, he has stayed ahead of the curve, truly understanding and anticipating the macro picture, while delivering consistently enviable returns for his investors. This is a man that has shaped the direction of an entire industry. This is his story. Raymond Dalio was born on August 1st, 1949 in Jackson Heights in Queens, New York. His father was a jazz musician and his mother was a homemaker. Raymond was the only child. Ray had a very close relationship with his mother, who sadly died when he was just 19 years old. His dad worked late hours, which meant that he didn't have a close relationship with him as a child. Dalio describes him as a reasonable man dealing with an unreasonable kid. He and his father did, however, become close after his mother had died, and he admired his father's strong character. Dalio described himself as a curious, independent thinker as a child. He was enthusiastic and excited about visualizing his goals. He would learn by taking a chance and failing at things. He says he used to strive for a lot and fail well, and believes that this is the key to success. He didn't enjoy school as he wasn't interested in the things that they were learning and found it hard to remember facts and follow instructions. But he was curious about finding out things for himself. He enjoyed playing baseball and touch football with his friends, but his mum would encourage him to study before playing outside, although he would never be interested in this. However, when Dalio was excited about something, nothing could hold him back and he would give it his full determination. He had a newspaper round at age 8 and many other paid jobs. He would struggle to do the jobs at home, like chores and things that his parents asked him to do, but outside of home he was really keen to do them because it meant earning money. He learned a lot through these outside jobs. Dalio began his experience with investments when he was 12 years old, when he began caddying at a golf club. It was an exclusive golf club where many of the customers were men that worked on Wall Street. He would hear everyone talking about the stock market because it was doing so well at the time and people were making a lot of money. He would pick up tips while he was working. He then saved up his wages and used $300 to buy shares in Northeast Airlines. He chose this stock because it was the only company he had heard of with under $5 per share. He got very lucky with this trade as he managed to triple his money, but this got him hooked. He thought trading in the stock markets was easy because of this, and a way to make easy money. After this first experience, he started collecting coupons for free annual reports from Fortune 500 companies, and he read all of them. This was the start of him building his investment library. He believes to be a successful trader or entrepreneur, you need to accept being painfully wrong a lot of the time, but need to look at things through the eyes of others to learn more. He speaks a lot about this in his writing about his principles, and the concept is something that he's followed his entire life. Dalio continued with the stocks while at high school and managed to build up thousands of dollars. In the meantime, he would be bunking off school with his friends. Dalio says he always loved being around other people and going out with friends, and still does, but is still an independent thinker. Between 1967 and 1969, there were big and unexpected price declines. He learned a lot through this because he realized the future is not necessarily what you expect. He didn't realize this at the start of 1967 though, so he started buying more stocks even though they were going down, and then lost a lot of money until he realized what was going wrong. 
Due to not taking much interest in school, Dalio's grades suffered in high school and he didn't make the grades he needed to get into college, so he only got in on probation instead. But college was a very different story to high school. He loved it because he could learn about subjects he was actually interested in and he enjoyed the freedom that came from living away from home. It was also in college that he took up transcendental meditation, which he still does to this day. He says it helped him a lot through his life to keep him thinking clearly and he attributes a lot of his success to this. You'll often hear him praise the benefits of transcendental meditations in his interviews or in his writing. While at college, Dalio also learned about commodity futures from an older classmate. These were attractive to him because it meant that he could trade with low margin requirements, so he could leverage the amount of money he had to invest and therefore potentially make more money. Back then, commodities futures were for things like corn and soybeans, agricultural products, so this is what he began to learn about. He majored in finance and got accepted to Harvard Business School. Before starting at Harvard, Ray took a job on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in the summer. He spent this time learning about the currency market and the cause-effect relationship of the price movements, including how people reacted to different news. The following summer, while everyone else was interested in currencies and stocks, he then got a job at Merrill Lynch trading commodities futures as this was what he was really interested in. While he was working, some of the currency markets crashed, and from this, he learned that when everyone thinks the same thing and bets on that same thing, it's usually going to affect the price and you shouldn't bet on it. Most things have happened before because of cause-effect relationships, so everything can be logical if you approach it in the right way. These sorts of experiences really shaped the way he built his approach to investing and trading. After this, stock trading stopped being so popular and commodities trading was back in fashion again. Because of Dalio's experience in this and his MBA from Harvard, Dalio was highly sought after. He ended up working for a brokerage firm called Dominic & Dominic as director of commodities, setting up a commodities division for them. Whilst working for the company, he still worked on his own investment accounts and continued to learn a lot through his losing trades. He especially learned a lot about risk control. He says, In trading, you have to be defensive and aggressive at the same time. If you are not aggressive, you are not going to make money. And if you are not defensive, you are not going to keep money. He went on to leave Dominic & Dominic for a more successful firm, which was called Shearson. He was in charge of the futures hedging business. He would help clients to manage price risks in their business by using futures, which also allowed him to learn a lot about grain and livestock. He spent a lot of his time in Texas and got to know all the cattle producers and grain growers very well. He said he built a second life with them. However, he was only at Shearson for a year until he was fired for punching his boss in the face. He says he was too wild to work there. Everyone in the company and all the associates really liked Dalio and trusted his information and advice. So because of this, he decided to set up his own firm. Dalio set up Bridgewater Associates in 1975. He did this from his two bedroom apartment. The name Bridgewater came because they had initially attempted to sell commodities from the US to other countries, therefore they were bridging the waters. However, it then moved on to become more of a consultancy firm. Essentially, he would put himself in the shoes of his clients and tell them what he would do if he was them, looking at their accounts and breaking down the financial or market risks and how to manage these. For example, in 1977, he made a trip to the USSR as a combined business trip and a honeymoon with his wife as the Russians needed advice on commodities. It was during this time that he began writing his models or principles behind the decisions that he was making. It was also where he took his belief in cause-effect relationships a step further. When he was learning about commodities such as grain, he would learn about every single part of the business, so that way he could predict every detail and the yields that this would lead to. This would later mean he could predict how much cattle would be eaten the grain, and therefore how much grain would be sold and produced. He says, 
By knowing how many cattle, chickens and hogs were being fed, how much grain they ate and how fast they gained weight, I could project both when and how much meat would come to the market and when and how much corn and soy milk would be consumed. Likewise, by seeing how much acreage was planted with corn and soybeans in all of the growing areas, doing regressions that showed how rainfall affected the yields in each of these areas and applying weather forecasts and rainfall data, I could project the timing and the quantity of corn and soybean production. To him, it was all just a machine of logical cause-effect relationships. These relationships are what gave him his decision-making rules and principles, which he recorded each time. He used to write on the back of envelopes and other bits of paper and draw charts in coloured pencils until he first got a PC and could start programming exactly what he needed. This way he could work out exactly how prices would move and what would be best for him to bet on. He measured demand in the amount spent and studied who the buyers were. This way he could find out moves that people measuring supply and demand in the traditional way missed. The whole principles process became something he would stick with from then on. Writing down principles, inputting them into the system and then following them. The system would end up working things out for him once he input the information, so it would effectively be making a decision for him. Clients would call him for his advice and his observations. This would take too much time, he would write it all down instead. He says this was good as it would force him to reflect on everything every day. He still does this now and millions of people still read this every single day. It has been praised for being ahead of the market with predicting some major events, although it has also gained some criticism, particularly in recent years. Dalio started managing company exposures by buying and selling financial instruments on their behalf for either a percentage or a fixed fee. Two of his biggest clients were McDonald's and Lane Processing, which was one of the biggest chicken producers in the country. McDonald's approached Dalio to tell him about a new product called the Chicken McNugget, but were reluctant to release it because chicken prices might be unstable and it would be difficult to sell the nuggets at a standardised price. Chicken sellers didn't want to sell at a fixed price as they were worried their costs would go up and they also wouldn't get enough profit. Dalio thought about the cause effect and realised that the chicken could be seen as a simple machine consisting of a chick and its feed. So the main and most volatile cost the chicken producer needed to think about was the price of chicken feed. Dalio showed Lane Processing how to use corn and soy futures to lock in their costs. This way they were able to fix their prices which then made the chicken more affordable for McDonald's. This meant they were able to go ahead and release the chicken McNugget all thanks to Ray Dalio. Has never, 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 ever, ever, never, ever been such chicken before. New Chicken McNuggets. Crisp nuggets of boneless chicken you dip in your choice of one of four great tasting sauces. New Chicken McNuggets. There has never, never, ever been such chicken before. Nobody can do it mm. like McDonald's can. New Chicken McNuggets. Also available in the 20 piece party pack. He did similar things for cattle and meat markets as well. He would work by using his clients' knowledge of their own business and the way they worked as a machine and Dalio's knowledge of the markets. This worked brilliantly and was profitable for both parties. Between 1979 and 1981, the economy was not looking good and markets were very volatile. In March 1981, Dalio wrote an observation predicting a bad depression and was confident about this prediction. This was very controversial, but Dalio believed in this prediction because of all of his observations up until that point. He even got others to scrutinise his observations and calculations to find any flaws, but they couldn't see anything different to Dalio. He held on to his bets and it looked like Dalio was correct in his predictions and his decisions started to pay off. He was featured publicly declaring that he was predicting a depression. However, in late 1982, Ray Dalio lost almost everything because of this prediction. In fact, what happened is that, in his own words, the stock market began a big bull run and over the next 18 years, the US economy enjoyed the greatest non-inflationary growth period in its history. Dalio says his experience over this time was like a series of blows to the head. 
He said it was a humbling experience because he was so publicly wrong. He also says that in retrospect, it was one of the best things that happened to him because it taught him a lot. He said before this, he was overconfident and didn't do his historical research properly. He ended up having to dismiss all his employees as he couldn't afford to pay them and went to his dad for money and had to sell possessions. He said it was devastating that he may have to give up on his dream and he had to make the decision whether he was going to give up and find a job or carry on. He decided to carry on. He went on to do a lot of self-development. He says you must learn how to fail well because failing can lead to improving on yourself. By failing well, I mean being able to experience painful failures that provide big learnings without failing badly enough to get knocked out of the game. He spent a lot of time working out his mistakes and realized he would need to look at himself objectively and change himself. He realized he had developed a fear of being wrong, so instead of thinking he was right all the time, he needed to change this and begin asking, how do I know I am right? He decided the best way would be to find other independent thinkers who see things differently to him. That way they can challenge what he thought, and then between them they could discuss opinions and would end up getting to the right result. He needed these people to be like-minded and to stick to the same principles. Dalio gradually added clients and grew a new team. He managed to rebuild the company back up to its former success. New technology helped do this over the years to assist his decision-making process as well as having like-minded people on his team. Dalio is a strong believer in a system that he calls idea meritocracy, which allows everyone to have a say in any discussion, but the more valuable you are in that field, the more weight your opinion carries. Also, knowing what people are like and how they think helps them to keep on top. By 1983, they were back up to six employees and there was a growing demand for the company's research. So, they hired a seventh employee and started selling their research as well. This attracted many institutional and governmental clients and added a new dimension to the company. The company continued to go from strength to strength. He says that first you must dream big. You can have anything you want, but not everything you want. So you need to prioritize so that you can make sure you get there. You may have to cut some other things in order to do this. Dalio says, life is like a game where you seek to overcome the obstacles that stand in the way of achieving your goals. You get better at this game through practice. The game consists of a series of choices that have consequences. You can't stop the problems and choices from coming at you, so it's best to learn how to deal with them. There are a number of points that define Dalio's approach, which we can all learn from. Firstly, he lives his life by a series of principles, which he has also written down for his employees to learn as well. He recommends everyone writes down their principles, the process they use to make decisions, and then follow these again in future. This also ties in with his belief in the cause-effect relationship in everything. If you can figure out these relationships, you can figure out what you need to do to trade or invest successfully in something based on the relationships between different aspects of the markets or industries. And finally, Dalio is willing to accept being wrong. In fact, he took it a step further and actually sought out people that were intelligent and independently minded enough to really put his thinking to the test and to point out his flaws. If you always want to be proven right, you are unlikely to get ahead, particularly in the markets, as being wrong is just part of the process. Learn from your mistakes, find out what went wrong and what was behind it, then write it down and move on to the next one. Bridgewater still prides itself on transparency amongst employees and even goes as far as to record all meetings and interviews so everyone can see anything they want. They call this level of honesty and openness radical transparency. The concept behind idea meritocracy is very important and this transparency helps all employees to feel that being open and honest is the best way forward. That way they can speak their mind, disagree with people, and it will all work for the good of the company as a whole. This is the same for all of his 1,700 employees around the world who currently manage $160 billion in assets. 
is this sort of approach to constant development, really trying to figure out the way things work and learning from all decisions that has allowed Dalio to make such fantastic investment decisions and to amass a net worth of around $17 billion. He has become one of Time Magazine's top 100 most influential people in the world and he has vowed to donate more than half his fortune to charitable causes within his lifetime. A fitting gesture for a man that put people and relationships ahead of his wealth and succeeded just the same. If you like this video, you may want to check out our previous episodes on people such as Paul Tudor Jones, Jesse Livermore and Carl Icahn. The link to the playlist is down below. Hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying this series and would like to see more Legends of Trading and Investing and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of them. Thank you so much for watching.